testing. Hi, folks. How are you? See you. Okay, we're going to start with a prayer. And in this prayer, you're going to hear something that we'll talk much more about on the third session, the perfect prayer from the Catholic Catechism. You'll hear elements of it tonight. So be seated, and we're going to pray. Blessed Trinity, we are in your presence. We thank you for the faith you freely gave us. Care for your church this evening. God, the Father, who sent your Son to redeem us through the gospel of faith, hope, and love, be with us this evening as we strengthen our faith by overcoming our doubts. God, the Son, who gave us the words, the relationship, the love of neighbor, be with us this evening as we touch one another with those words. Let all speak them well. Let all hear them well. Let all learn them well. God the Holy Spirit, who asked these folks to present your gospel this evening in these dramas, in these pictures, in these lessons, inspire them with your wisdom. Be their tongues. Let them speak with your love for them and all here this evening. Be with our teachers, be with our learners, be with our believers as we grow together in faith. Amen. Amen. That was good. Okay. <laughs> now, first thing is, who am I? Who is Nancy? Well, we've been prisoners here for 27 years, and sometimes we meet you when we go to Florida because it's we got tired of shoveling snow. But it's pretty hot down there right now, so we return for the summer. Um, why are we up here? Why should we be talking to you about these things? Well, we have some background, so you don't have to worry about the theology, or the psychology, or the philosophy, or the communication. We have degrees in all of those areas. Uh, we did this program in Florida where we invented it first. They did very well. But I'm telling you, I'm not sure what I'm going to tell them about who's the better cast. I'll have to send an email out after tonight and tell them how well these folks did. What's the genesis for this program? The genesis are, is the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, which are gifts that are given to you in baptism. You can never lose them, but you can not take care of them. But faith needs to be nurtured. So we decided we were going to do these three theological virtues. Faith, hope, and charity. We did them in Florida. It was very well received. Uh, when we did uh, love, for example, we carved that into two sessions, forgiveness and love. And we changed forgiveness to pardon. We had folks raise their hand and pardon people that they had to forgive. Whether they're in San Francisco or Illinois, they don't have to meet somebody to pardon them. And about love, some people say, I don't even like the person. How am I going to love them? We changed that to regard. We would love to do that here, perhaps next year. Then, we said, coming off these three major virtues, there are the other ones, the bridge virtues, the cardinal virtues. They're called cardinal because they're bridges, which are prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Those four you do not get from God. Those four you're on your own. And those four you need to get into heaven. And we will cover those in some way. And you'll think that any sin that's ever been committed has four violations in it, and they violate these four virtues. So why doubts? Because people have doubts. Pope Francis said we improve our faith by resolving our doubts about faith. So we identified six doubts. Two for this evening, two in July, two in August. What we thought were the chief doubts as to why people lose their faith. I have at least two people in my own personal family that have lost their faith because of one issue or another, either with faith or the church or teaching or something like that. Can you help me out this evening and raise your hand if you know somebody that's lost their faith based upon some way in which they were disappointed in their faith or their church? Good, so. Thank you. That will validate what we're going to do this evening. Now you have a playbill. The playbill is a keeper. It's got a lot of stuff in there. It's got a lot of psychology as well as theology. Why psych? Because God made man 
and he made him a psychological being. Inside these virtues, you are going to see psychology working. We're going to show you that in just a minute. Once we understand the psychology, we see how the theology fits in with it. Sound psych, sound theology. And just one word about the church and religion. I do not want anybody to get the wrong impression about the second scene tonight, in which a character called Rule has obeyed all the church rules and the church disappointed them. We are not saying that you should ignore church rules or ignore church teaching or church authority. We are not saying that. What we are saying is that there are people, there are people who have lost their faith because they were just rules people. And they made that mistake of making rules their faith. They didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. They had an organizational relationship with the church. And when the church failed her, or somebody in the church failed them, they lost their faith. We need to cover that tonight because of all of our experience. And so, we'll begin. I need to stand, I was told I need to stand at a certain spot on home being camp, so I need to go over here. I want to try to be left-handed or right-handed, that's going to be really interesting. Okay, so, no, feel, do. This is the beginning of the psychology of the human being. You don't do anything unless you first know something, then you feel something, and then you do something. You cannot do something unless you have an attitude to do it. And you don't get the attitude to do it unless you know something, even a piece. We're going to talk about starter pieces in religion. Now let's follow these three and see what they got. One is information, the other one is called attitude, the other one is called behavior. Sounds pretty simple, but that's communication. The church is into communication, we're into communication. We communicate with God. We go to communion because we want to go to communion because we think God is in communion. Think, feel, do. Don't do unless you feel, don't feel unless you think. What we're going to be doing, dealing with tonight is that first part. So we look at the mind. When I taught my students at university, I used to tell them to think of these three things as mind, heart, and hand. No, feel, do. They become faith, hope, and shadow. That's exactly what God has. No, feel, do. These three are these three are these three are those three. And this is the God we're dealing with tonight. With, of course, that. Doubt. That ruins the faith. It makes us question it. You're going to hear in the first scene, the lady says, nobody ever comes back from the dead. Ever, ever, ever. Why does somebody come back? Nobody comes back, so why should I believe it? These people want to know. They cannot get to believe because they want to know. And we're going to see where those two don't mix. So, there's six common faith doubts. Tonight, we're doing evidence and religion. The first one is there will be no doubt about afterlife, therefore God does not exist. The second one, religion or the church or somebody in authority or somebody didn't treat somebody right and so they disappointed the believer and the believer took off. I have at least three or four stories today that are better terrible. I mean, they're really sorrowful more than anything else. Second way, please come in July, is reason and science. Only fools believe in fairy tales. This is what they're telling the kids today. Everything is reason. You shouldn't believe in fairy tales. If you believe in faith, you're nuts. It's not that at all. And this guy is going to be really interesting. We're going to talk about Darwin. We're going to talk about chance. Is it possible that chance cause life? We're going to show you uh, a terrific philosopher of science, Stephen Meyer, who wrote three books. His last one just came out. I'll bring them and show you. In which he says it's impossible that chance cause life. Not possible. I should have many zeros go after the possibility of chance. That's probably very interesting. And of course, the third night, two huge problems. I prayed in God's name. I didn't get it. Why not? Did the scriptures say, pray my name, you get anything you want. I didn't get it. No matter what it was, I prayed for a, a good birth. It didn't happen. A job, it didn't happen. So therefore, who needs to believe? And finally, evil. Thomas Aquinas is going to visit us, and we're going to talk about how is it that a good God could allow all the evil in the world? It's called theodicy. 
And they're trying to say, if you have evil, you can't have a good God. Aquinas will explain how that happens. So, this is the first thing. The first one, we're going to talk about the chain of faith from the Catholic Catechism. You are a link in a chain. Break the link, and the chain is not whole anymore. We're going to talk about saints and doctors, and I hope tonight I have enough time to talk about the Eucharistic presence. You do know that study. Father Thomas told you about it two weeks ago when he preached. It's been all over the internet. 69% of people who say they're Catholics do not believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Not saying that other people go to communion. We don't know exactly who they are, but that's a big number. And then you know what to say. They don't believe it because they don't know the teaching. And one in five who know the teaching don't agree with it. So we're going to talk about the Eucharist. We're going to dispel all the doubt about how is it possible that Jesus could be in Summers Point and over here and in Florida at the same time that, that everybody's in the same little flake of bread, the same drop of wine everywhere. How is that possible? Quite a century. We're going to also talk about this let down. That's the girl that was mistreated, we think, and then she lost her faith. The second night, we're going to talk about reason and faith and all the secular attacks that are going on today, about Darwinian evolution and about intelligent design. Did this universe come from some intelligence or not? Or did it just accidentally appear? What's that possibility? What's that probability that happened? So we're going to talk about fairy tale or dreamer. He says, you know, I don't want to believe this stuff anymore. I'm getting so tired of defending the faith. Yeah, these mysteries, these mysteries are tough. You're a Catholic? The Trinity, the Eucharistic presence, two natures in Jesus, the Assumption, the Ascension, the Immaculate Conception. Really? You believe all of these high beliefs, these high teachings. Sometimes they're tough to believe, but somebody comes along and says, nah, can't be, can't be. That's what they tell the kids today, because I taught in the university. I know what it was like, and it's even worse since I left. So we have Darwin down, science, and of course we will have a discussion tonight. After each of the dramas, we will have a Q&A. So you're going to ask any questions you want. If you don't want to ask about yourself, just stand up and say, I have a relative who can talk. <laughs> and that's all right. And we'll answer whatever question. You, we'll try to answer whatever question you have. And so, chance of intelligence, we're going to give some tips for parents and grandparents how to help these kids. I have a granddaughter now, and I really work with her, to be honest with you. She comes home and she tells me what they're teaching. And we're going to have to change that and have arguments for it and reasons for it. And then on the third night in August, we're going to talk about unanswered prayer and the difference between expectation prayer, where you pray to expect something, or you pray and it's if it's a God's will, I will get it. But not to always expect it. The two characters are interesting, they're needy and greedy. But needy needs lots of stuff. And greedy wants all the stuff that needy is asking for. And we're going to go to Thomas Aquinas's. You'll, you'll learn this later on. Doctrine of lacking. It's fascinating how he explains what evil is. Evil doesn't exist. It's nothing. It can't exist. It's the absence of good. It's like a puzzle with a piece missing. Lucifer is not all evil. He can't be, because evil does not exist. He's good going astray. Good going astray with a piece of the good of the goodness missing. It's going to be a really interesting discussion. And then the unanswered prayers, problem of evil, and what's allowed to evil. There are the three nights. I show you them now. You'll see the poster outside. Please come. Tell your friends and people that might gain something from it. We had a couple of non-Catholic people come, and one woman came, and her husband had done something terrible to her in the years before, when they were married, before he died. She left the presentation, she went home and she forgave him after all those years. Something, something triggered in her mind that she should do this. Okay, so, what's the virtue? The goal of a virtuous life is to become like God. Now we can't become God. We can't even approach that, but we try to become like God. God has no faith. God has charity. God has no hope. When you get to heaven, 
face and hope are done. You're finished. All we have left is charity, and that's what heaven is. Heaven is, and I told the people in Florida, as I said, oh, you have to come to the next presentation to find out what it is. I didn't feel good about that. So the next day when I made another presentation, I said, okay, here it is, people. Heaven is knowledge. You will know God. You will know God as he knows you, and you will know yourself. So well, didn't St. Thomas Aquinas say you're going to see the beatific vision? That's the same kind of see where you say, see my meaning. You see what I'm getting at. The angels can't see. People have not resurrected from the dead yet. They don't have any eyes, but they know. Think of what's in store for you. Absolute, perfect knowledge and happiness after that. Okay, so these are the three theological verbs that are core. You get these for free when you're baptized. And then we have the moral virtues which come off of these things. And you nurture them, they grow, you ask for grace. You need to be virtuous to get into heaven. And it's one of the reasons why we're going to deal with these. And so we have the great virtues which are not accused by God. The cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, 42 and temperance. And once we, we, we explore all of these, we have all the tools we need to enter heaven. So, okay, let's talk about it. the sources of everything we're going to talk about tonight. Thomas Aquinas, the saints, the doctors of the church, and the Catholic Academy. Now, let's begin. Faith is an act of the intellect. It is not a whim. It's not a feeling. No, it's no feel do. It's no. So when your faith starts, you start with a starter piece. I, I love the appearance of the Blessed Mother. To me, the Blessed Mother appearing is a starter piece for me. And from there, I ex expand faith. But I need a starter piece. If I wander around saying, well, I believe in the Immaculate Conception, I believe in this, and somebody says, why do you do that? And I, I don't have any knowledge piece to start with. I can't explain the doubt. So saying yes to divine truth that's not knowable until we until we get it revealed to us by God. That's why the first character wants to see somebody come back from the dead. It's possible they're in a different realm, and we can't communicate with them. That's possible, but that's reasonable. And so, by command of the will, St. Anselm says, we seek understanding. Who wouldn't want to know? The character tonight is going to tell you, would you rather know or believe? She says, no, of course I'd rather know. Who wouldn't rather know? But we can't know. So we start with no, and then we believe. And it's God's grace, faith is an infused virtue that we have. So what is believing? Well, it's necessary for salvation. At baptism, they say to the child, the person being baptized, what do you ask of the church? Faith. And you get it when you're baptized. Believing is trust and revelation. Everything, four to six, and everything that's contained and handed down to us as divinely revealed, we believe it. Now, wait a minute. How do I know it's divinely revealed? And that leads back to another starter piece, which leads back to another starter piece. The historians, Josephus, all the people give us a record of what's happening. And believing begins the beatific vision. Even here on earth, as you start, you have the beginning of seeing God because you know, you know a little bit about it. So what is believing? It's a church act. St. Cyprian said, church is the mother of believers, and I really want to emphasize, emphasize that tonight. Let's not discount the church's role in our faith formation. No one has God as father who does not have the church as a mother. Believing is a human act. It's saying yes to the intellect and the will to God revealing himself. You do that all the time. You say in the Apostles' Creed, and you say in the uh, Nicene Creed, which are defective by the way, because they do not contain the Eucharistic presence that is not mentioned in either of those creeds. And then you wonder why 70% of the people don't believe it. They're not saying it every Sunday. The Pope could change that, by the way. They should. So what's the meaning? Our moral life has its faith source in God who reveals his love to us. St. Paul said obedience of faith is our first obligation. 
The ignorance of God explains all moral deviation. Ignorance of God. You know what that means? That means we should study. Like you're doing tonight, as you're doing tonight. Learn, study, and move forward. Faith duty is to believe in God and to witness God. So, look at the great Testament figures who struggled with their faith and struggled mightily, but they kept their faith. Abraham struggled to walk in the faith, but Abraham was chosen as the first Jew. Jacob struggled with the angel all through the night, but he was named Israel. Jesus struggled with his father's work in the garden, but he raised himself from the dead. They never lost faith. They struggled, and struggled and doubt the same. So what is this chain of faith that the Catholic Catechism talks about? No one has just an individual faith. Yes, you have an individual faith, but you belong to a community of believers. And your faith is attached to another, is attached to another. Break the chain and you leave somebody off. Each person's link, we set the faith from one and we pass it on to another in an unbroken loop from God back to God. The Apostles' Creed is the profession of one link in the chain, but the Nicene Creed is the profession of the entire chain. Do you remember when you were younger you said, we believe in God, the plural? Now, in 2011, they changed the translation for the mystery. Now it's, I believe in God. So both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are personal affirmations, I, I. But originally, one was I, the link, and one was we, the chain. So in your mind, if you feel like you can go back to the old one and say, wait, because when you all profess it, so the Catholic Catholicism says, when you, you, you'll see that when you all profess it, it says, you join the whole chain. So God the Father, I, I, the Holy Spirit, we, consubstantial. Nine times, the original Nicene Creed used us and our, our Savior. The second, third day, he rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand, returns to glory. We believe the Holy Spirit, we believe, we believe, we expect the resurrection. And it changed in 2011 from we to I. The Catechism says, whoever says, I believe, pledges themselves to the rest of the crowd, to we believe. We're getting our basis in what faith is before we start looking at the doubts. So, this is how faith works. Everybody's got a start with peace, that's a fact. We need something to start with, we just can't take it out of thin air. Faith, if we lose trust in that start of peace, then our faith starts to weaken. So, for example, this is what we know, it has to start with a start of peace. Uh, for example, the Eucharistic Presence. It's a start of peace. If you doubt it, your belief gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it causes faith to get smaller in proportion to your doubt. If the doubt balloons, it squeezes out what you believe. Everybody in this church probably has doubted at one time or another some article of faith or some teaching. And you overcame your doubt by going back to the starter piece and saying, well, that was true. So how do faith and doubt relate? What we know and what we doubt. As the doubt gets resolved, the belief grows. That's what we're here for this session, July and August as well. We're going to improve, improve our faith and lessen our doubt. And we hope that everyone is much more comfortable with their faith. It's a struggle to place our in the lordship. Struggle is not failure to engage in the poll, as the Catholic Catechism. Pope Francis says doubt is part of the journey of faith. And this program hopes to ease that faith journey. This is the distinction between faith and reason. This is what the kids are facing in college. And we're almost finished this section. We're going to get to the first point. Faith and reason. Is faith unreasonable? Not if the starter pieces are reasonable. For example, a jury says beyond a reasonable doubt. They think it's reasonably true, but it's not a fact. But it's reasonably true. You would go against reason if you said no. So, the universe. Faith and the universe. Is it reasonable that God created the universe? 
faith always agrees with reason. Always. Always. It's reasonably true, but it's not a fact. You don't know faith. You believe faith. So we have angels, and we have guardian angels. Do we believe in angels? We must have a starter piece. Do we believe in the, the guardian angel? We've heard stories about that. Do you have any evidence? Has a guardian angel left any notes under the pillow? Has anybody seen a guardian angel? So then you start to say, well, maybe there's not a guardian angel. But okay, I want to believe there's a guardian angel because I believe in angels in general. That's how the doubts start to come in. Faith can start with evidence. In fact, the faith goes way beyond evidence. Do not look for evidence in faith. You're looking for facts. You don't match. The blessed mother, of course, one I'm pretty uh, dependent on is the old crutches in the church. That's a fact. They were healed. Hey, I'll take that fact. Then I think she appeared. Then I think somebody came back from the dead. Then I think there's an eternity. Then I think she's the mother of God. I'm okay. Everybody needs some starter piece like that. Faith and reason can never, ever conflict. We know facts. We do not believe facts. So, we're going to start with our first drama now. And this has to do with somebody who says, I never seen a friend come back from the dead. We call it the arrogant doubt of evidence. I need to know, to know that somebody's going to come back from the dead. I wait for signs of life. God is this. No signs come. Why not? God wants us to get to heaven, he should give us a glimpse of heaven. So still believing, God is believing so hard. So we're going to call our cast up now, and they reduce them to the first drop. And they're going to walk through this problem of needing evidence. So St. Teresa of the Sioux will be played by Judas Spires. St. Teresa of Avila by Jerry Barsati. Undecided by Kathleen and Carol Vanderbilt. And as they take their seats and lie on their mics, we'll set the stage for you for this scene. Undecided here, Undy, we're going to call her the flesh, wants to see somebody come back from the dead. She demands facts. What about what? Mysteries. Big problem. Using personal stories of her, the two doctors of the church, we use all the female doctors of the church. Thank you, lady. They are going to allow her to only, not only to know, but also to believe. They're going to mix knowledge and star pieces with faith. Because the living and the dead are in different realms, and they get it all. Little pedal by pedal first. 
then a little cloud, then heaven. Well, of the millions who have died, why don't people see someone like you two? Why doesn't God send us someone so we can stop doubting and go all in in a serving God? Show me the money and I'll give you the show. Oh, I mean, service means giving us the show without all the money. Otherwise, you got all the reward here. You. you have no rights to further reward after you die. I know. I had to switch from reward now to reward later. You had a hard time with your faith, didn't you, Babylon? Weren't you more interested in boys and jewelry and flirting than you were in the convent life? In my day, that was convent life. Really? Right in the convent? Right in the convent parlance. But I put a stop to it. I struggled with my faith because of the corruption I saw. I, too, wanted proof that God was somewhere in the middle of all this corruption. So, how did you solve it? Through prayer. I developed a special way to pray, and I taught it to everyone. I wrote about it. I kept my faith by actively trying to keep it. What are you doing, Andy? What do you want God to do for you, undecided? Look, just send us one person. Just one. Send him or her to the UN. Send him right here to St. Damien's Parish. Or let him walk across the bay to Summer's Point. Right in front of us, right now. It wouldn't be such a big thing for God to do this soon. But he is pretty stingy about giving us a glimpse of the afterlife. Well, he did send his mother to Bernadette, the Fatima children, the Metaphorgy teenagers, and others. See what I mean? The Blessed Mother came to them, not me. How do I know she's really got it? You have to take their word for it, Andy. A lot of people have seen the sun spin around in colors. And our lady has a few at Medjugorje and at Fatima. What will satisfy you, Wendy? Seeing the sun spin around? Or do you need the moon or Pluto to do something too? Look, I'm not trying to lose my faith. I want to believe, but I also want to know, is this stuff we believe true or not? Isn't that the ultimate question that we all have? That's the question. Miss Sue, what's your answer? Look, knowing and believing don't go together. They're like scales. When one goes up, the other goes down. And the real issue, God wants, perhaps needs, Believing. Believing is earned. Knowing is, well, just knowing. But undecided wants more knowing and less believing. Well, so would everyone. A lot of people want to see someone come back from the dead. Don't you think they all want to know that all this believing is paying off someday? I mean, really? Hey, 
no better than the Romans, who had 28 gods, a god for everything from wine to doorways. The Romans were misguided, and they say we are too. Right. They say rules, like the French Enlightenment. Man can explain everything for his own reason. Man doesn't need spirits, souls, miracles, incense, chanting, chalk statues, beans, holy water, or gods. They make me feel silly about believing, about faith, about God. Andy, you have a choice. You can make reason more important than faith, or you can believe that Jesus is real and he wants us to stay firm, just as St. Paul says, and not get impatient. The reward will come. How do you keep your faith value? Many days I ask myself, do I want to know or do I want to believe? Our, which do you want to pick? I want it to pick knowing over believing. Every day, because it's more certain, and I will be using the brain God gave me. See, you were losing your faith too. Oh, no, no, honey, she's not saying that she didn't want to believe. Were you out? Right, I do. I am saying I preferred to know what I could know and to believe what I could not know. When I realized humans could not know certain things hidden from our nature, everything changed. It was simple. Why try to know what you can't? Just believe what you can. Maybe the dead can't visit us in their condition if we're not in their condition. Perhaps the two don't mix, like oil and water don't, unless God permits it, as he does with his mother's appearances. I decided, can you accept that explanation? I think I can accept that, but I need more of that reasoning to respond to my critics who say I'm just a delusional believer. Many of Christ's children in St. Damien's house are using more of that reasoning too. Right now. Funny, they're using reason to support their faith. That is strange. Using reason to explain why we can't know and probably should not know certain things until the end. You are a dreamer, Andy, and because you dream, you believe. You dream of never-ending happiness. God asked you to dream that dream, and he asked you to keep that dream alive until he calls. Those who doubt, stop dreaming as they sluggishly awaken to the I must know disturbing alarm clock. The alarm clock that says, awake, awake, stop dreaming. Sleep in, honey. Keep dreaming. Keep hoping. Dream, honey. Dream, dream, dream. dream. dream.
Yes, please. Yes. So I'm saying. Saying that. Okay. If you say uh, loud enough, I'll repeat it very loud. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and say it loud enough. I thought it was a wonderful presentation. It was uh, uh, very neat. You did uh, draw on psychology, theology, and philosophy, as you said. I would want to go back to something uh, that helped me when I was younger, and that was the old, uh, uh, I guess, position of C.S. Lewis. That God would either the teacher was either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord, uh, depending on whether you believe the scriptures or not. And then I think the issue after that is whether the scriptures are believable. And I think that there, there's a lot of scholarship that, that uh, suggests that they are believable, but I don't think it's a proof. So no. I, 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 I would just wonder if. Uh, because, because we do have a testimony about the resurrection in the scriptures. You have eyewitness testimony. Uh, you, you have, uh, uh, it runs through, it runs through Luke, it runs through uh, uh, Paul. And uh, wait, shouldn't that be enough? If you believe the scriptures are believable, if they are believable, and that can be a big gift to a lot of people, but if you believe that they're credible and they're believable, then shouldn't that be enough? Okay, yeah, so, so the question is, if the scriptures are your starting point for faith, uh, how assured can we be that the scriptures themselves are true? Yes, I thought I heard from Saint Roby when you mentioned C.S. Lewis, that they believe in Jesus, therefore they believe in the scriptures. You weren't saying that, or what are you saying? I, I, I think it's the other way around. It should be. I think it is the other way around, yes. It, it, it should be. If the scriptures are, if the scriptures are believable, then you've got the choice. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he was Lord. And then you come down to the point of whether or not the scriptures are reasonable. And I think there's been a lot of scholarship, especially in the last century or so, but I guess starting from the, the 1900s and the early in that, that suggests that they're not. But there's also countervailing um, scholarship that says that they certainly should be covered. You can't prove it. But it certainly should be credible. And that's where you've got the motivation for the motivation. That's, see, would, you, would you be willing to tell us tonight that one of your starter pieces is belief in this scriptural revelation? No, I, I think I just believe because it's a matter of art. I think one, with, with me, if, uh, you know, I, 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 I've heard the scripture, uh, mm -hmm. I've heard the story, uh, I heard the story before I became more familiar with the scripture, and it just resonated with me. Uh, okay. But at the same time, since the topic tonight is doubt, I think you need motives of credibility as well. And I think what, what was it, John Paul II said that, that the motives of credibility are, are, are both faith and reason, they're both faith and wings that apply to faith or both faith and reason. You know, the two wings, and that's the reason I brought it up, because the topic is doubt. Awesome. That's okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a low-budget operation. We don't have that long boomer mic that we can stick in front of people. So if you did hear a little bit, belief, a star of these is believing scriptures, and from that it goes forward to believe in other mysteries. Uh, I'm going to show you some star of these in just a second. Other questions and comments?
which is, which is what faith does, that goes beyond it. We'll show you some starter pieces to keep in your mind as you're talking to young people. Don't talk to young people. Listen. They won't tell you that starter pieces or not. That's what I'm going to do with my grandmother. Talk to me. Tell me. What do you, what do you know? And then we'll talk about what you can't believe. More? Come back there, please. Yeah, when you use the mic, it's a lot easier for everyone. I just wanted to clarify that faith and reason never conflict. The, the, the faith and reason never do conflict. And Thomas, Thomas Aquinas said in, in his writings, uh, when you look at science, and in his day some people were questioning the science, they were saying, see, look at the science. How could there be God? His basic response was, the science is God. Whatever you see is God. That's what he did. Show me something. Show me the stars. Show me the sun. Show me light. Show me DNA. That's God. Reason, he said it never conflicts with reason, but it will always conflict with fact. Reason and evidence are two entirely different things. That's what jewelry show is. Reason and evidence. So it will never conflicts with reason. Otherwise, you would be dreaming. You and you would be attacked properly. They would say you're a dreamer, you dream the things that, that have no basis in life or what we see. It happened with is the earth going around the sun or is the sun going around the earth? Well, it's pretty obvious what's happening. So you say, we'll start with that. That's a fact. They never do. They, and we're going to make a statement pretty soon that Jesus performs a reasonable miracle and transubstantiation. It's reasonable because what our side said. Show you that. Thank you. You. Okay. All right. Let's, let's finish up that first drama. Show you some starter pieces. Okay? Now we go right back to what we started with. And so now, my weight will end, then I'll know, yeah, that's it. When it's all over, we'll be done. Then you will know everything. That's what we're waiting for. If I were an apostle and saw Jesus, that's money. They had a lot easier than you people. They saw Jesus. They saw the Christ on the dead. Have you seen that recently? You see anybody come back to the bed recently? No. They had, without money faith, you need credit faith. So the answer would be, how is your credit faith? Because it's all you have to go. Unless somebody here has seen the blessed water? Maybe? Not yet? Not me, not yet. Okay, so we now will say, how does faith work? This is one last slide. To say that starter piece, what we know, what we believe, we doubt it, it erodes faith. So strong evidence of the starter piece is necessary for strong faith. Don't believe nothing, air. You don't believe in air. Faith is always greater than the starting. And some basic starter pieces of scripture, tradition, church teaching, history, appearance, and miracles, but it goes way beyond that to here. Trinity, the Immaculate Conception, the Virgin Birth, the Blue Nations of Jesus, the Resurrection, the Ascension, the Papacy, the Church, the Eucharistic Presence, Sacraments, Orders, Forgiveness of Sin, Resurrection of the Body, Final Judgment, Lake of the Do you believe all of those? Yeah. Yes, okay. And if you do, you must have a star in peace from each one of those. It could be the scripture, it could be history, and even on this side, do you believe all of these? Original sin, heaven and hell, purgatory, angel, devil, ashes, water, wishes, meal, sin, world sin, prayer, nature, statues, relics, miracles. Because that's where the attack comes from. Oh, you people pray the statues. Oh, you have indulgences. Oh, you people who believe you people are crazy. And yet, that one of these things might be a starter piece. Rock on to it and hold on to the starter piece. So, in the believer, we now move to, and once again, this is not anti-church, this is not anti-rules, but the character will expose some problems for folks believing. So if some people, like the character coming up, learned everything that they learned about their faith from, thou shalt, thou shalt not. This is a sin, that's not. The church says to receive ashes after communion, 
to the gospel, being a friend of Jesus by loving him and your neighbor is the sign of a true believer. Listen to Augustine rule of all people he knew about breaking rules. He even gave his mother, St. Monica, a hard time until he met me. I straightened him out to become a saint when I showed him that there is spirituality beyond the rules. You mean Augustine was breaking moral rules when he was rejecting morality itself? Yes, I had two concubines even when I had a wife. I thought these rules didn't apply to me. So Augustine, how did you find morality and God outside the rules? I realized that I was breaking rules to be independent. In fact, I really like breaking rules. But the breaking freed me to follow another rule, the right one. When I baptized Augustine and his son, Augustine adopted the rule of love, of God and of neighbor. He realized he found a rule he could follow to be himself. Can you follow that rule and find yourself with a faith that you can live with? I don't know. I, I just don't know. It's not how I was brought up. You know, the church is God, is always right. No matter how I feel about what it says or who runs it. Look, I don't know exactly what happened to you in your church, but why don't you tell us your story and we'll see if we can get you back on the right track. All right, all right, you ready? Thank you, thank you. First of all, <laughs> the deacon wouldn't come to the cemetery to bless my parents' graves. He said it was a secular cemetery. Then the parish secretary from the 
gift or the messenger from the message. Fine. But, but please, don't get me wrong. I love my faith. But my faith doesn't love me. Listen, your faith is not a thing that you subscribe to, like a magazine or Netflix. Your faith is your personal response to Jesus Christ. The church is not a faith vending machine where you put in your quarter and out comes some faith. God gives you the virtue of faith, not religion. Faith is like your citizens and the other of the right granted to you by God, not the government. If the government misbehaves, gives you a bad governor, school board, or dog catcher, you don't give up your citizenship because of that. Faith is an infused virtue gift, like an inalienable right, as Augustine said. It is yours. It can never, ever be taken away from you. But you can foolishly surrender it in anger or in disappointment. What, what can I do? In Luke's Gospel, Jesus said, Woe to, your, to you scholars of the law. You impose burdens on the people, but you do not lift a finger to help them. Jesus is on your side, not on the side of rude shepherds. The question is, are you on his side? He said he would never abandon you, but are you abandoning him? Oh, no, no. I would never abandon him. I just said I was losing my faith. I never met my relationship with Jesus. What's the difference? Look, if, if a particular deacon won't bless your parents' graves, take your faith and go bless them yourself. If a particular secretary won't take your food, find another church that will. And as for mass, find a shepherd with a habit of throat that's not going to choke you. Do you, do you think I can do all that, ignore the rules, and still be faithful? Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Be careful here, Lord. You can't ignore or abandon the church and just have faith in your mind. You, we all, need the sacraments. And the sacraments are in the church. Follow the scriptures for your answer. Augustine will tell you how. Remember, Jesus healed the man with a withered hand in the synagogue itself on the Sabbath. Jesus asked, so is it unlawful to do good on the Sabbath? When rules stop you from expressing the gospel's love message, ask Jesus for advice. He gave it when he said to the Pharisees, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So faith first, rules all the rules are means to an end. When the means don't get you to the end, by all means, get there another way. But get there. Don't ever, ever, ever sit on the side of the road with a withered heart simply because it's the Sabbath day. Find that shepherd who never cared what day of the week it was or where it was. that we use to talk to God, but out of mercy and love, as he did for that man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. And for you, Lord, God just might enjoy some original wine.
She's an aberration. But what was her problem? Her problem was she vested everything in simply obeying the rules. She never made the transition as to what the rule was about. Let me show you what. Let me show you what she might have done. Same with you there. The reason I keep going back and forth is I'm still going to stand on this side of the farm. Okay. So, see, when you have a rules only faith, I'm sorry, I have a couple of relatives like this. When you have a rules only faith, perhaps it creates an obedience faith and not a relationship with God. Everybody should come back to the community and talk to your friend. Just talk to them. When we do the perfect prayer for the Catholic Catechism, we're going to say, you shouldn't even ask for anything until the fourth part of the prayer. Come say hello. Thank you. Take care of your church. This is what I need. And goodbye. Do the five parts of the perfect prayer. Rules require defending the rules. Oh, I made dinner for you. It's Friday night. You say you don't need to go away. You made this wonderful dinner, but I'm not going to eat it. Then I have to defend the rule. And, but I'm like, but somebody who said, maybe I can step aside from the rule for one and not embarrass this person to be charitable on this Sabbath. Measures to devil by saluting rather than loving. It possibly changes uncritical followers into rules followers, and this is where our kids are going to get into trouble. If they only think that you have their faith that we should follow the rules, and then somebody at the college challenges the rule, and we never told them why we follow the rule, they can never tell them why we follow the rule. It requires behavior for its own sake, and it has no redeeming motive other than behavior. I follow the rule. It's got to go beyond it. You've got to get the benefit from the rules. So here's what is inside. Rules faith can work. Let's say that clearly. A rules faith can work. Here's how. First of all, rules can lead to salvation when you cherish the motive of the rule and not in the rule itself. Learn the rules motive. Adopt the motive before you act, have the attitude before you behave. If you know the rule and your motive is follow the rule, and then you follow the rule and say, know the rule, love my neighbor by following the rule, now I have a loving act, not just a behavior act. Apply the rule to yourself before others. Suspend the rule to allow the good. We would all do that. Jesus did. Follow the rule spirit if you're in doubt. At least follow the spirit if not the letter of the rule. Discard the rule if you need to be loving or merciful to somebody. Invent loving rules for certain situations. Find the Holy Spirit in church rules. Yes, it was made with the spirit in mind. Discover that spirit. Then you can say, okay, to the rule. So many people say, why do we have to do this? Why do I have to do this? You hear the complaint? Why do I have You don't know the reason for the rule, so it becomes just a rule. Rules alone cannot save, faith alone cannot save, only acts are necessary for salvation, and faith-based acts can save. So this Pew study in 2019, we are going to do this because it's our obligation to tell you what the teaching of the Catholic Church is for the Eucharist. Because so many folks don't know. Here it is. With some heresies and some answers to the heresies. 69% of Catholics who receive Holy Communion do not believe Jesus is present in the, in the Eucharist. Do not believe that He is there. There are a lot of reasons for that, too. Is He really, He really there? They're the big ones. Him, all of them, body, soul, man, God, really there? Only 31% Thank you. 
There are three issues with the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. We'll take the three issues, then we'll go back and show you the heresies and men in each in the first issue, and then the teaching of the church. First, uh, three of the words sustenance. That's not like the big words. I like to say some force that's supporting you. The look of red wine. We are not going to talk about accidents and all that stuff. It's what it looks like. Without the actual red wine, what makes that look stable? Even taste like it. Two, the real change. How can Jesus' nature, divine and human, be present? And every little plate of bread, you see the priest tap the pen and clean it all off and make sure that every drop of wine is, is in the water and then they cleanse the vessels. Jesus is never wondered, how is that possible? Quite a chance of that. Three, multi location, which means all of them all over. How can he be in every drop? As I said, here, Summers Point, Florida. How is that possible? So let's take the first one. The heresy that God is not present. Yeah, exchange the grace of humanity, but not the divinity. That's a heresy. His divinity is there. God is not present. Jesus' divinity as well as his humanity are present in change, bread, and wine. This was the Council of Constance in 1414. They condemned this heresy. There are some religions that would believe in it. It is Jesus, but it's not God. It's just a God, Jesus. Amen. Heresy to it. Oh no, the real bread and the real wine are still there. Jesus is there, but so is the bread and the wine. It's a heresy. The real bread and the real wine are gone. Their looks remain. So after the consecration of the real Jesus, his body, his soul, his humanity, and divinity, take their place. Take the place of the real bread and the real wine. Not the look of the bread or the look of the wine, but the real bread and the real wine. Consequence. Heresy is great. The look of the bread and the look of the wine cannot be there without there being real bread and real wine. Not possible. Well, Aristotle said, and the point is agreed, this is, this is a brainy teacher. It is possible to have something like Tony without looking like Tony. Then you can separate what something really is from the way it looks. That what something is, is not necessary to the way it looks. Aristotle told that way before Thomas. He had gotten that. And he said the look of bread remains. What keeps the look of the bread? God's power. Thomas Aquinas said it's not Jesus holding up the look of the bread at all. It's God, the power of God. Jesus is not a substance for the look of the bread at all. This was Aristotle's contribution to the difference between look and something looks like it and something it is. Heresy 4. <laughs> the look of the bread and wine, oh, it's an illusion. You people think you see bread and wine. It's not over there. It's something else. You're all being deceived. It's kind of a silly heresy. The look of the bread and the look of the wine are there. But the reality is gone. And we know this is possible by philosophy. Therefore, it's reasonable. Therefore, God performs a reasonable miracle. We'll stop philosophy first, and then the other. And that was the Council of Conscience condemned that heresy. So what is the sustaining power? Jesus' nature cannot support the look of bread and wine. Transubstantiation, the change of the reality, one reality to the other, supports the look or not the substance. Council of Conscience, Thomas Aquinas, and Aristotle. So what is this thing called transubstantiation, which is in the Catholic Catechism, which you learned in your Catechism a long time ago, that Jesus is present every part of it. Here is how Aquinas explains it. He says, the soul is present in every part of our body. So why is it not possible that Jesus is whole divinity and his whole humanity is in every part of the world? And every drop of wine, just as your soul is in every one of the cells in your body. If one is true and reasonable, the other one is reasonable. And faith and reason can never conflict. The soul is an old body part. 
We have this guy with Ron. He says, well, that little Jesus is all over the place. That when he made Jesus of all of us, and started to wait here and stop doing nothing, there are a bunch of little Jesus. But Robert Hubbard said that a full real body should be in three-dimensional space. Hey, Father, how long am I going to host? And you say Jesus is there. I don't see a three-dimensional body. Why is that? Because it's a miracle. It's a miracle. God prefers you not to see that. Well, and I was doing this in Florida, and people said, well, what's that from? I said, poof, it's a miracle. God does that miracle. So, the glorified body of Jesus is not restricted to time or space. It goes to a tomb, goes to the upper door room, it goes to the to heaven, therefore it can be anywhere, everywhere. Minus, minus the law. Nobody knew. This will accompany you with the resurrection of the body. He said that at the end of time, your energy, think of physics today, your energy is yours. No matter if fish eat it, if they burn it, it doesn't matter. That energy belongs to you and it will be constituted into you. Energy to matter, as physics says it's possible, at the end of time. He also said, he also said with this multi-location, you know, you do know that electrons, they go around the new things can be anywhere. At any time, you know, I look at this book, now the electrons are there. He said, when the priest says, this is my body, then Jesus is there. When he says it, it happens. He's everywhere, anywhere, then he's there. He's anywhere and everywhere, and then he's there. The electrons are everywhere and anywhere, and then it's a cookie. They're anywhere and everywhere, and then it's a book. Faith is reasonable. Reasonable. So, what do we go with this breaking of bread? Jewish right of master at the table. Early Christians broke bread, the mystical body of Christ. And we talk about it as well as being the thanking God, the Eucharistana, which is the Jewish blessing. He calls the meal of God's works as creation, redemption, and sanctification. It's called the Eucharistic assembly because the Eucharist is, is, is practiced in front of the whole assembly. It is a mass. The mass is the assembly of the people. Cannot have a faith without the Eucharist. Cannot have a mass without the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. For what we communion before you commune with God into one body. So the Catholic doctrine clearly is because Christ our Redeemer said it was truly his body that he was brought from under the species. It's always been the conviction of the Church of God and this holy Catholic now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the whole substance of the body of Christ, the whole substance of the wine into the whole substance of his blood. That's called transubstantiation. And now you know the Catholic teaching on the universe. That is yours now. And you can teach it to the kids that it's reasonable. So there were three Eucharist miracles, so you have heard about these things, they're amazing. One of them was consecrated hosts were perfectly preserved for over 250 years in 1730. The look did not drop, and scientists could not explain it. Then in 1331, the Eucharist fell out of the mouth of the woman and onto an old cloth, and it was retained there as a spot of blood. When the priest picked it up, a spot of blood remained the same size as hers. And then there was Italy. Eighth century, consecrated bread and wine turned into flesh and blood. The flesh was harmless, arterial, veins, and nerve fibers. The blood type, as in all other true Eucharistic miracles, was type 80 positive from a male of Middle Eastern origin. A little starter piece of faith, you see something like that? Okay, maybe he really is in the universe. So, faith is believe God, reflect God, and doubt not God. Now let's take the point of final question to the last strong and the Eucharistic teaching of the church. Whatever. Yes, please. I have a question regarding why we began receiving the Holy Eucharist. 
about making them, you know, they don't want, then they won't go to church at all with you. You're happy they're going to church at all. You know, they're 21 so, years old, just coming back from college. As a Christian, as a Christian what do you want from him? What do you really want for him? Um, well, he says he believes, and we want him to go to confession and he'll start receiving properly. But how do you do it without turning them away completely, which is the fear? You're not going to get somebody to go to the sacraments and this is going to go back and look at the start of peace. Does he even believe that somebody can forgive a sin? Does he believe in forgiveness? Now, and remember, he, about confession, somebody steals money and they go to confession. I would ask him, what do you think should happen to him? And you say to him, you know, there's two parts to confession, there's guilt and then there's penance. When you say you're sorry and the person gives you, the guilt can move. But as Thomas Aquinas said, the imbalance is still there. You have to do penance. Now, if the priest says, say three Hail Marys, is that balance, stealing money? Or should he say, go give the money back as your penance? Talk to him like that so it becomes reasonable. He says, well, that would be reasonable. So I can go to confession, confess something, and then remediate what I did wrong, get rid of the guilt, which should be great for him, and then rebalance the order, as the client said. Would you like to be guilt free and order? But start with them. Don't preach to somebody. This is what I used to tell my students when they were about ready to make a presentation. If you see people with their arms open, as in high school, there were three levels of people. Up front were the do-gooders of the pencil paper taking every word the principal said. In the middle, there were people saying, okay. And in the back, there were the jocks with their whistles and their feet up and saying, oh my God. If you Never approach somebody like that until they unfold in their arms. Let them have their say, take their objections, take care of them, then when their arms are unfolded, then you need to go to them. Unfold his arms first. Okay, take 30. Okay. So, Sam wants to say a couple of words. Uh, I just want to say, say thank you to uh, Father Thomas Newton, our pastor, for all the support that he's given us. Uh, the parish In your creatures, in your humans, I will not stop. 